All right, welcome to today's video. And for today's topic, I thought I'd spend some time and answer a question that was recently posted to me here on the channel. And that's my preferences to naturally aspirated engines or ones with forced induction, as I've got experience with both and do currently own both. So let's go ahead and start by going over the background on what the differences are before we dive into what I prefer. So a forced induction engine is where you have an air pump, typically in the form of a supercharger or turbocharger that pressurizes the air and fuel and forces it into the engine to produce additional power. Whereas a naturally aspirated engine relies solely on atmospheric pressure to get the air and fuel into the engine to create power. So with forced induction, you basically got two types and you're basically looking at superchargers and turbochargers. Now, there are various forms of each, both superchargers and turbochargers. We're not gonna dive into the details of what types there are. We're just gonna go ahead and keep things at a higher level and talk about general differences between turbos and superchargers. So for starters, let's go ahead and talk about turbochargers. Now, what's great about turbochargers is there are no parasitic losses because they run straight off the exhaust gases compared to a supercharger that is belt driven and runs off the crankshaft and uses some horsepower of the engine to make its additional power. So turbochargers, what happens is you have the exhaust gas running past a wheel that then turns a shaft that has a wheel on the opposite side of the turbo that turns and then pressurizes the air and forces the air and fuel into the engine. Now, it sounds all great that a turbo is the way to go because there's no parasitic losses, it's basically free horsepower. But there's a catch, and that is heat management. Because you're running off the exhaust gases, the turbos get really hot and produce really hot air. And as a result, you typically need to run additional uh, equipment like an intercooler or even an intercooler sprayer to get that charged air temperatures down before you force it into the engine because hot air doesn't make anywhere near as much power as cold, dense air. And so that's another drawback to running a turbo is there's a ton of extra hardware that goes with it. And you have to run all this piping to get between the turbo and your intercooler and then back to the engine. So if you've got a project that's running a limited amount of space, routing all of that extra hardware could be a problem. Whereas a supercharger, you don't have those constraints. Basically with the supercharger, because it doesn't run off the exhaust gas, the air that it's producing is nowhere near as hot as a turbos get. So there are some supercharger systems that are running an after cooler that drops down the air temp and condenses it, makes it even denser, um, but it's not as necessary as if you have a turbo engine. But like I mentioned earlier, the downside to a supercharger is it does run off of the crankshaft in order to produce power. But on the flip side, because it's running off the crankshaft, the power curve that it adds is very linear and it follows the RPM range of the engine. Whereas with a turbocharger, you're running off, since you're running off the exhaust gas, you can have a situation what's called turbo lag. And the amount of the turbo lag is how much time it takes once you start spooling up the turbo to get that dense air all the way back around through your intercooler and all the piping back into the engine to produce the power. Now, of course, with advances in turbo technology, and if you size the turbo properly, you can reduce the amount of turbo lag to almost non-existent, but you start getting into some really complex hardware and design factors. And so some, a lot of times people just deal with a little bit of turbo lag. And that's where you have your trade-offs. Do you want to have some turbo lag, but you're not having the parasitic losses of the, of the supercharger with the crankshaft drive, or do you want to not have the turbo lag, but have a linear power curve and have less plumbing to deal with by using a supercharger? Both have their pros and cons, but at the end of the day, you're still going to be producing a lot more power by using some sort of force induction. I mean, you can take a naturally aspirated engine and add either a supercharger or a turbocharger and make a lot more power. So there's other benefits to force induction as well. And one of the big things is when you're dealing with elevation changes. Because a naturally aspirated engine is reliant on atmospheric pressure, if you're at sea level, like I am here at California, you're not gonna have too much of a loss doing, due to having low air pressure. But if you're in a higher elevation area, like say Colorado, where you're up at a mile up above the sea level, you're gonna be losing power because your air up there is a lot thinner. 
So if you're having the, you can see huge power differences on a naturally aspirated engine between sea level and mile high city of Denver. Whereas on a force induction engine, you can either dial up the boost on a turbo or change the pulley out on a supercharger to crank the boost up and you can make a difference for that offset. That's where another big advantage of the force induction is. And then another advantage to the force induction is when it comes to efficiency. And that's why you're seeing, especially on the exotics end now, with your uh, Ferraris, McLarens, Lamborghinis, starting to go towards having force induction on a lot of their engines, is because they're more efficient and they can hit those fuel economy numbers and the emissions numbers that the federal government is starting to require. So with naturally aspirated engines, in order to get the big power numbers that you're seeing out of the force induction engines, you have to do things like increase displacements, and increase the cylinder head volumes and capacities, change your camshaft profiles, and you have to do a lot more to the internals of the engine to make the same kind of power that you can out of a force induction engine. And the old adage goes, there's no replacement for displacement. That's because the more cubic inches you have, the more volume of air you can run per cylinder and make more power. So, but of course, that comes at the cost on the efficiency standpoint, which is why you're seeing more and more cars from the factory going with forced induction. Now, everything that's so far makes it sound like you should be running forced induction no matter what. Well, there's a big factor that has been missing up to this point that we haven't discussed, and that's reliability. Now, sure, you can definitely make forced induction vehicles more very reliable. I mean, that's why the manufacturers are offering from the factories, because they've got to go through and hit reliability numbers. But, as a general rule of thumb, when you're adding more hardware, more parts to a system, there are more things that can break. There's, so your reliability is gonna be affected somewhat. So that is a huge factor that is something I contemplate when I'm building one of my cars or when I'm buying a car, is what type of reliability issues are we gonna be facing? And of course, turbos are gonna be the worst from a reliability standpoint because of the heat factor. And we're talking a huge amount of heat that you're having to deal with. So that being said, for me, it depends on the situation. Generally, I like to do force induction, specifically turbochargers on four cylinder engines, because trying to make a, a huge amount of power out of a little four cylinder can be a real pain because its displacement is so small and you can only make the displacement so large. Whereas if you add something like a turbocharger, you make a huge amount more power with out going through the expense of adding huge cylinder heads or stroking it to a large displacement or big profile camshafts. It's really handy. Now, some uh, companies out there offer supercharger kits for four cylinders. I and Chevy even offered the Cobalt SS as a supercharged model for a while. Same with Mini Cooper. Uh, the Cooper S was supercharged for a while. And it works, you make good power, but at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, the parasitic losses associated with putting a supercharger on are amplified that much more on a four cylinder because you have such little power to begin with. And so that's why on a four cylinder, I generally prefer to go with a turbocharger just because you're gonna have less parasitic losses and I'd rather deal with the heat management side than deal with the losses from the supercharger. Now on larger displacement cars, like the V8s, V10s, things like that. Those, generally speaking, I prefer to run naturally aspirated. I, I've got friends and know people, especially on the Vipers, that are running superchargers or twin turbochargers and are making insane power. But at the same time, what's that power good for? I mean, if you're doing uh, airstrip mile attack runs and top speed runs, sure. Having a force induction added to a Viper is a huge plus because it's an easy way to make a ton of power to be able to put down in those types of events. They also is great for sitting around and having arguments on who's got the most power. Well, if I've got twin turbos on there making 2,000 horsepower, there you go. But putting that power down and the type of driving I do, it just doesn't make sense for me. I mean, I've thought about putting a supercharger on the Viper uh, several times over the years and at the end of the day, it just doesn't make sense for the type of driving I do. I'm going to different like cars and coffee events, going on mountain cruises, things like that. I don't need to have a thousand plus horsepower. I mean, right now it's probably making somewhere over 550 horsepower and it's making plenty of power for the type of driving I do. I mean, if you go and are putting 1,500 horsepower down on this car, 
you can get in trouble real quick on a mountain road just by accidentally hitting the throttle a little too hard. Next thing you know, you're off the side of a cliff. And so it just doesn't make sense for me. So for the most part, I prefer to keep them naturally aspirated. Four cylinders, of course, those I like to go, force induction, specifically running turbos on them. Um, some of the muscle cars and stuff, if I'm building drag race type cars, sure. Putting a supercharger on there works perfect, but it's all about the application. And most of the stuff I do don't require that type of power being uh, produced for the V8s or the V10s, just because they make enough power as it is for what my applications are. So at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong answer between superchargers, turbochargers, or naturally aspirated. It really comes down to what your application is and what you prefer to use. And I'll always have a variety um, just because of the different types of activities I'm involved in. It just makes sense to have a variety of setups to go through. So those are my general thoughts. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, which versions you prefer, whether you like naturally aspirated or if you prefer forced induction. Go ahead and put the comments down below and I will definitely uh, be reading all of them and interested in seeing what you have to say. And as always, if you like today's video, go ahead and smash that like button, give us a thumbs up. And if you wanna be kept up to date on my future videos, go ahead and smash that subscribe button down below and ring the notification bell as well. So that way YouTube keeps you up to date of all the videos that I post in the future. And as always, I will see you in the next video.